Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for joining us today for our 360 Dialogue webinar. My name is Leila Duraz, and I will be your facilitator for this morning's proceedings. Today's session, entitled Data, the Golden Resource of the Future, will aim to discuss the role and value of data within digital economies, while shedding light on the associated risks and potential challenges. With the recent global developments, stronger emphasis has been put on the importance of data in the era of digital transformation. A data-driven economy paves the way for new business and job opportunities. Therefore, companies need to establish or advance their data capabilities in line with their overall business operations and strategies. Before we get started this morning, I'd like to bring to your attention some key interactive elements uh, of our webinar today. All delegates will have an opportunity to send questions to speakers throughout the webinar using the ask a question icon at the bottom of your screen. You can also use the dialog box to the right hand of your screen if you wish to communicate with any of your fellow peers present today. There will also be an opportunity to download any reports made available by our panelists this morning in the top right hand corner of your screens. I would now like to introduce Hassan El Heshemi, Vice President for International Relations, representing Dubai Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Over to you, Hassan. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome from Dubai Chamber of Commerce and Industry to our first 360 Dialogue event of the year. This series highlights issues of particular interest to businesses in Dubai drawing valuable expertise and insights from business leaders who are making their mark on their respective industries and responding to new COVID-related challenges. Today, we live in a world where everyone turns to digital channels to access products, services, and content they need. Companies have uh, ever-expanding options to connect with consumers and access to greater volumes of consumer data than ever before. Digital transformation, driven by COVID-19, has not only underlined the tremendous value that data offers from a business standpoint, but made it a necessary tool for any company that wants to remain profitable and competitive. Now, here in Dubai, data-driven innovation is playing a crucial role in supporting the Emirates' vision of becoming a global smart city, developing new sectors, and driving sustainable economic growth. Considerable progress is being made on this front as the government implements open data policies and procedures to enable access to UAE data for the community through its different e-portals. The country currently ranks 16th globally out of 187 countries in the Open Data Inventory Report 2020. Yet, given the rapid rate at which technology is evolving, businesses must continue to find new ways to leverage data to their benefit, while staying informed of industry trends, challenges, and opportunities. We are truly fortunate to have with us an esteemed panel of knowledgeable experts from the public and private sectors who will offer their perspectives and insights on the role of value of data within digital economies, while shedding light on the associated risks and potential challenges, challenges uh, within the business ecosystem. We also have an opportunity to get a glimpse into the future and hear from our panelists about where data-driven technologies may take us in the post-COVID era and beyond. Distinguished guests, from a business perspective, we've seen growing interest on the part of companies in Dubai that are keen on expanding their digital presence and integrating data into their core business models and strategies. A data-driven economy paves the way for new businesses and job opportunities. Therefore, companies need to establish or advance their data analytics capabilities in line with their overall business operations and strategies. 
Sharing data transparently supports policymakers and industry leaders with decision-making processes, efficiency in resource usage and management, and exploration of new areas of development and growth across all sectors of the economy. Ladies and gentlemen, our discussion today comes at a fitting time as the UAE reaches new frontiers, accelerates its innovation output and creates a roadmap for a digitally driven economy. Now with all of these changes around us, we at Dubai Chamber are playing a crucial role in keeping the business community informed of the latest economic developments and market trends. This 360 dialogue series you are attending today is a key initiative in advancing some of these efforts. I truly look forward to the forthcoming discussions, which I hope uh, you will find uh, thought provoking and informative. Thank you for your kind attention and participation this morning. Thank you very much, Hassan. Um, I would now like to introduce um, our moderator for this morning's uh, session, Xavier Anglada, Managing Director, the Strategy and Consulting Lead Middle East, Accenture, who will be moderating our panel discussion. Over to you, Xavier. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Many thanks, uh, Hassan, Leila, and uh, Rana, and the overall Dubai Chamber. It is really a pleasure uh, for myself and the fellow panelists to be uh, with you today. It's a key topic, the one we have on the table. And yes, we all say that uh, data is the new oil. I always say data is much more than the oil because it can be reused, it can be augmented, and it brings complete new di dimensions of life, right? So I, I represent Accenture, I'm the lead of strategy and consulting innovation. Data is one of my top agendas in, in, in my day to day. And um, for us, Accenture, global player, um, for, uh, we call data as one of the alpha trends and AI underlying unto it. Why is that? Because basically we are in an exponential growth of devices. So we have over 50 billion of connected sensors that measure location, motion, light, heat, sound. And we have more than 20 billion uh, IoT devices that bring data on a very constant basis into the systems. And there's over 40 billion, 4 billion connected people into high speed networks, right? So 5G is only increasing that capability. And corporates and governments uh, are increasingly sharing those data globally. And we, we were estimating that 80% of the 14,000 uh, corporations have an public APIs. They share some of the information to the broader community for some business or development purposes, right? And we produce over 40 exabytes of mobile data per month. I don't even know how many num uh, zeros uh, represent that. So it's amazing what we're producing of data every month. So, and not only that, but the unit cost, which is very relevant to produce, to compute, is decreasing exponentially, which means this proliferation of data even much more in the acceleration mode over the coming days. So we will never have as limited data as we have today. Tomorrow we'll have more and the day after even more. Then when we talk about data and artificial intelligence, I want to move that in that space because this is where we're gonna see and we're seeing and we're gonna see more material change across. So artificial intelligence is a constellation of many technologies working together to enable machines to sense, to comprehend, to act, and to learn. And the, that part about learning is where we are making really the difference uh, less recently. And, and this is where, uh, where we try to emulate human sim, uh, similar intelligence uh, is where we're starting to see new waves of bringing AI at the core. We were discussing before in this panel that uh, Zoom now, and it has been over the last few months developing, can create amazing uh, tune-ups of our faces, of our makeup, of our... This is the reality. So 
uh, you apply some of these technologies uh, about uh, uh, um, bi biometrics, uh, about data, and amplifying the capabilities of the, the people that is interacting. This is making a material change on the experiences, right? That's why we believe in Accenture that AI and data is much more than a simple technology. We believe it's a GDP enabling uh, uh, dimension. We typically, the economists typically, and we in, in business schools, we always learn that there are three elements, three factors that affect GDP, to grow the GDP. One is labor, the other is capital, and the third is productivity. We believe, and, and, and the conclusion of the economies is because uh, labor growth, the number of working age people is uh, stagnating, capital efficiency is limiting, and productivity can increase, but on, only at a certain moment, we are in the midst of a very low era of, uh, of growth and stagnation. We have a different view. We believe there is the fourth dimension into it, which is AI, data-driven AI, right? That, and, and this, uh, we believe that this creates a virtual dimension, a new um, a virtual dimension into creating growth for the economy. And for this, we've done uh, with scholars uh, a very detailed research in the region and in the UAE, and we've identified that by 2035, we're seeing extra $182 billion of extra value added into the UAE economy if we bring upscale data and AI into it. And it can impact across many dimensions. Let me put an example for uh, climate changes. So, uh, so AI can improve the efficiency that the power plants reduce emissions. Um, oil prices, so machine learning and computer vision analyze satellite, satellite images of crude oil supplies and can optimize the supply chain. Water scarcity, we have a material challenge, only 5% of the world population, but we, uh, we have only 1% of the, uh, the world's uh, um, uh, available water supply, which means we need to optimize water and analyze soil and understand where and how to optimize the pipeline distribution on this. There's a lot to be done there. Again, rapid urbanization, there's many dimensions where the UAE can, can really leverage uh, uh, the power of data and AI into it. That's why this discussion today, this panel, and you will, yeah, I'll introduce with my fellow panelists, it's absolutely spot on because we have the government dimension, the hyperscalers with Microsoft, and as well, the consumer goods. When you bring this together, this is the right dialogue to bring uh, data and AI at the transformation level, right? We're seeing in, in the UAE uh, different dimensions of impact of data and AI. One, bringing intelligent automation. So, which brings uh, automating facility, bringing the smart facility, right? Creating the, and we have oil and gas plants that can be brought a lot of data driven uh, with drones, with uh, uh, um, uh, data analytics, corrosion analytics to understand that the oil pipes uh, uh, evolve uh, uh, smoother and, and safer. We, we as well, we, we believe that AI needs to be complemented by the human part, the human plus the machine. And, and that, when you bring these two together, you augment the capabilities of the workforce. So that part of the workforce and the, the skills on the, on, on the workforce around data and data plus uh, yeah. AI plus machine uh, together, we will see this increasing it more. And, and, and of course, we're going to see that this innovation will impact across industries. We're seeing a few industries really impacted in the UAE in the coming years due to data AI. One, financial services, clearly very strong, over almost $40 billion of extra value for financial services out of it. Healthcare, very strong, and COVID only made this even more relevant. I was yesterday in a, uh, in a discussion with one of the global uh, experts in AI in medicine, and he was saying, healthcare in the coming years, we're going to see basically data scientists supported by clinicians, not the opposite, right? Because data science is becoming really at the center of, uh, uh, of healthcare. Of course, transport and storage, this is going to be absolutely very relevant. So there's really a call to action here of the whole ecosystem. On one side, the policymakers, right? Preparing the next generation of workers, growing the, the talent pipeline. Globally, we have an, a scarcity every year of 700,000 data scientists. So talent is going to be fundamental. And when we say this, it's not about only universities doing that, but there is apprenticeship because when data scientists leave university, 
they need X amount of years to learn, to improve, and to really connect. This doesn't happen the first day. So there needs to be a factory model almost of data skills creation that need to be brought into the economy, right? UAE has the potential to leapfrog all that because of the vision, because of the leadership, the, the agenda uh, uh, on data, and we need to put the workforce, the skill set at, at the center and become really a global test bed for social AI. AI needs to have, and data needs to have the responsibility part, needs to have the, the ethical part. And so all these are key topics, right? So, so the policymakers will have a key, a key dimension into it. But of course, business leaders as well. So corporates, the, the highest performing corporates are the ones that really tra transform their businesses applying data at scale. And I'm not talking about the digital players only. Large corporates that are pivoting their businesses, leveraging data end to end, from the data management to the decision making to the even sharing data and amplifying. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to give this introduction saying that we are in, in the middle of a fantastic discussion point in a moment of truth that COVID only accelerated. And now, yes, I want to open the, 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 the panel to my fellow colleagues. We have with us three very relevant stakeholders here. On one side, uh, His Excellency Yunus Al Nasser, uh, so Assistant Director General to Smart Dubai. Smart Dubai is our leading uh, frontline uh, visionary entity on creating data and AI at the core of the economy in the government sector, but across. We have as well uh, Bahero Eight Insights Director for Africa, Middle East and South Asia in PepsiCo. It's going to give us the, the, the consumer good dimension. And of course, all this enabled by the hyperscalers, by the cloud enablers. We, and we have here, we are really pleased to, to have Leila Sahan, Public Sector Director in Microsoft. Uh, and I think we'll have a super interesting discussion. I'm really looking forward to it. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave to each and every one of you to a few minutes to present when you introduce. But let me start specifically to discuss about the role of data. I'm going to start with you, Excellency around Smart Dubai, because Smart Dubai, um, it, the business economy is very keen to get to learn from you about all the efforts to bring digital transformation in the Emirate, right? And um, you're, you're becoming a benchmark on smart cities, uh, Dubai, and you are an enabler out of it. So um, how did it all start? And where are we going on this, please, uh, Excellency? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good morning, uh, everyone, and I hope everyone is safe and healthy during these uh, challenging times where COVID is all around. Uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank the organizer, uh, Dubai Chamber, and provide us this interesting dialogue with, uh, with interesting uh, dimensions that we have in our hand. And if I go back to uh, Dubai and how the whole story started, I think it's a journey that uh, the country has been in for the past two decades or more. Uh, the journey has started uh, with a visionary leader whom uh, His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum wanted to make Dubai to an electronic government. And this is where the race towards digitizing government services have started. And he have given a deadline for the city to have only two months for the government to become, a, to become an electronic government. Also, he wanted to build the internet uh, city in, the, uh, in Dubai. Uh, fast forward, uh, in 2015, this is where the vision of a smart uh, started. It started with a uh, smart government, but very soon, uh, the announcements of uh, smart city concept have started in Dubai. And the vision was to transform Dubai to become to the smartest city. I think we've mm -hmm. had all of the enabling uh, services that's available. Uh, Dubai have always been known for having world-class infrastructures. The same is with the digital infrastructure. So we had the digital backbone, that is nurturing all government services that was available. The concept of the smart city started back then also bringing all constituents together, the public sector, the private sector, and also all in the context of the individuals to make sure Dubai, Dubai becomes the smartest and happiest city on earth, touching the life of every individual with the technology being the mean into doing this transformation in the city. With that, we've really taken the responsibility of enabling this transformation with our uh, partners from both public and private sectors. We've acted as a catalyst into enabling this change. 
And for that, we had a lot of objectives that's been set and setting a role model, a smart city that can be uh, uh, looked at as the capital of the smart cities. So within the smart city, we were the smart city planner. We were setting all of the plans that we wanted to transform within the Emirate of Dubai, utilizing all the assets that we have in, the, in, in our hands. And at the heart of that comes the data. Data is the digital assets that have been accumulated over the past couple of decades, and we will hand it to the future generation. We need to make sure that we are maximizing and we are capitalizing on this effort. It's becoming the new digital economy. So how do we handle that? One of the main themes that within the smart city of Dubai we had was is to govern the data within the, the data within the city. Second was also to enable it with a proper digital infrastructure that is enhancing the transformation in the Emirate of Dubai. To have a set of shared services that's also leveraging the power of data, providing it as a service to the uh, different government entities. We've also, all of those ambition plans have been backed up with a lot of, uh, I would say, forward thinking strategies. One of the main strategies that we, were in hand, we had in hand was the Dubai paperless strategy. And if you can think of paperless, you know, what does that really mean? Eliminating papers and going into digital. Digital meaning accumulating more data. And we are very proud to say that in December, uh, 12 of December, 2021, we are going to, uh, to, to celebrate last transacted paper within the city of Dubai. That will be eliminating 1 billion paper and also at the same time saving into the uh, dollar uh, signs of around 200, uh, $250 million, uh, bringing back uh, 30 million hour of productivity back to every individual that's living on this city. Another initiative has been always also that at the heart of a smart city is making sure that data is available. And we wanted to make sure that 100% of the city data is available for exchange, being it available as a shared purposes, but also open data. And open data becomes the digital economy of the smart city, enables a change, enables and also drives the smart city decision that enables a smart, I would say, policies that is needed. And I think a good example of a smart policies is also around COVID. And we see how the city has evolved always backed up with the science and data. And also, you know, for that, we've launched a set of uh, initiatives and, and, and solutions. And here, I would like to highlight the most recent one that was launched by His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum when, uh, when, when he launched the uh, Invest in Dubai uh, platform. And this is, again, digital platform providing a seamless experience for all investors that they want to come and invest in Dubai with zero interaction with service centers and providing an access to open up a businesses in Dubai within a couple of minutes and have an access into starting their businesses. Again, those platforms is enabler for smart cities. And this is how we are leading the transformation. I would like to end up uh, this question with going back again to the data. Data is, a, data is the new economy. And again, countries, cities who are really prepared with the proper foundations, with the proper governance around it, are the ones going to unlock the value of it. People's refer, people refer to the data to being you know, the uh, oil of the future. Some of it, you know, they, they refer to it as a gold, some of it as a steel. I think what's really important is that you know, we are having the right enablement tools in our hand into unlocking the value of it and utilize it during these challenging times. And I think this is the era where data can provide a lot of benefits to the smart city. Talanthi, thank you so much. A very, very enlightening and very ambitious plans, the ones you had, the ones you've delivered, and I'm sure the ones you will come will come soon, right? Because I think the, the hunger of this city of reinventing itself is, is always on the front line. Maybe we, we could see the video that uh, you brought for us uh, around Smart Dubai and how approaching the, all this transformation. Absolutely. With Invest in Dubai, you can launch your business in just a few minutes. As the first integrated digital platform for setting up a company in the city, Invest in Dubai eliminates the need for any in-person service center visits, helping you get all the necessary approvals from one single platform. Along with obtaining commercial licenses, there's a wealth of information available to investors. Use the Business Setup Simulator to learn more about applicable license types. Access the Dubai Business Map to identify the best location to set up your business across various industry sectors. Access the latest business news and start your business today. 
Join thousands of investors and entrepreneurs from different nationalities writing their success stories. Use Invest in Dubai, your gateway to the world capital of ambition. A great manifest of the uh, of Smart Dubai being a bit at the forefront of this wave of data transformation. So uh, I wanted to now go into bringing data into the decision making and and the, one one of the critical points about data and we, we've done as well surveys uh, around the 200 top leading companies and organizations in the region and we've seen that the champions of change the one that grow three times faster than the rest are the ones that bring data across end to end so they have the data management they have a data governance about how they manage to share the data uh, uh, to create value from it, and that they do fundamentally every decision data-driven. I would like to go back to you, Excellency, about, um, so tell us the, the different platforms, projects that you have that Smart Dubai is offering uh, data-driven uh, services into their customers. And, and there's quite a few apps that we all use, and maybe you are not fully aware about how they were created. So, Please enlighten us a bit about uh, what, what are those platforms and, and, and apps? Well, again, you know, uh, uh, the ultimate goal of smart cities, again, to enhance uh, the uh, individual's life uh, within the Emirates. Uh, and I think our focus has always been to start with the government. And my example over here is from uh, the paperless strategy. Of course, with going to paperless, this means, is, you know, we are digitizing more the city services and making sure that we're providing a seamless efficient and safe journey to every individual. The, uh, the portfolio of Paperless had uh, a focus of around 300 uh, major services that's offered to individuals within the city. Of course, you know, when you look at 300 services, you, know, you don't expect people to download more than uh, 300 apps. You know, uh, as an individual, we are interacting with the city. So uh, Dubai, Smart Dubai have launched the Dubai Now app, a single stop shop for individual services interacting with the city of Dubai from one single uh, app. It have taken uh, into an action the uh, design principles of pe basic people's needs. And from there, we've really looked at those needs and prioritized the services. We have today more than 120 services that individuals can benefit from and more are coming uh, you know, as we are speaking today. And every day there is a more uh, services is being added to it. An example of those services is when you are settling your uh, utility payments today. Then you have, I'm sure, you know, uh, most of most of the people in the panel today have a lot of utility bills to, to be settled. Dubai now allows that to happen in a minute, or even you, know, you can automate it with you know just setting your data over there, and then it can do the transactions on on, on your behalf. Uh, another example of uh, an app within a small city is again, uh, or solutions that we've uh, offered, the platform that uh, we've just seen the video of it. It's a new platform. It's digitized more than 200 uh, business uh, activities within the Emirate of Dubai, uh, with the lead from uh, the Executive uh, Council of Dubai, uh, Smart Dubai and Dubai Economy, with also more than 25 uh, government entities. We've been able in a very short period of time, and it was only, only about four months to bring up a full platform, full village of digitizing the services uh, within, within the Emirate. When it comes also to uh, the government itself, uh, I'm sure you know, a lot of you are familiar with ERP systems. Within the government of Dubai, we have the GRP system, which is digitizing the entire uh, cycle of uh, running the uh, uh, financial uh, resources and also uh, the uh, human resources services into uh, a fully uh, digital service with data driven at its heart. Another example, which is also uh, dear to our uh, period that we are in at the moment is the you know, COVID. And we've uh, been, uh, we've partnered with the decision leaders here in Dubai and also with the different stakeholders to make sure that we understand the uh, COVID situation through one single dashboard. This dashboard has been fed with the data that's coming from the city. Uh, it is particularly looking at the current situation of the pandemic, looking at the healthcare capacity that we have available in our hand, looking at the critical supply of the resources within the healthcare over here, and also at the same time, using scientific approaches of data science in terms of building prediction models 
understanding what kind of different scenarios that the city can go on when you are coming and trying to impose different policies and how also you can balance between the social, the uh, economic and the health uh, aspects uh, when you are uh, deciding and, and having a smart policy making within the city when it is really challenging and things are so dynamic. Again, this platform has been used as a good example of how a city can always become a data-driven city and also brings the data at the heart of every decision on all levels, being it strategic on the leadership level, being it on the executive levels, or even on the operations so that you know how do you move resources from one side to another. This is a great example that's coming. And I'm very proud to say many of those technologies is being in-house, being the capabilities that we have in hand. We have had a lot of investment in youth, a lot of investment to bringing those things and bringing, building human capabilities whom in a short period of time can utilize, can transform, can show a good example of how uh, a city can become a data-driven during any period of time. And I think, you know, uh, last example I would like to refer to, and this is on a country level, I would say, you know, uh, if you look at today the Mars mission, the scientific mission that went all the way, you know, 500, uh, 500 million kilometers away from here with the scientific mission, all of what's bringing back to us over here is data at the end of the day. So you could imagine, you know, for, for a city to be futuristic city, you need to understand where you are here today, utilize the data that you have in hand, but also, but also looking very forward and bring it back to the day and start analyzing. Very good, Excellency. So always uh, inspiring to see how government is spearheading all this journey towards a, a data-driven economy, right? So let me uh, take now a segue into, let's see how the private sector enables all this, because the reality is the, the perfect conjunction to deliver this growth on the economies to bring the two parts. And one of the connecting dots into this is the role of what they're called the hyperscalers. And we have here the pleasure to have with us, Leila, that leads the public sector in the UAE for Microsoft. Leila, big pleasure to have with us. And I think your role as Microsoft, as partner in Smart Dubai is very fundamental, right? And it's been even more fundamental in the last few months in the pandemic times where people needed business continuity. They needed to work from home. And your infrastructure, your capabilities, and your presence in the, in, with Azure in, in, in the region, in, in the country, really was a, 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 a deep uh, step forward into this, Leila. So what, what, what is your uh, role uh, that you're bringing to accelerate this transformation of the Emirate? Um, thank you, Xavier, and I want to, to uh, welcome everyone and wish that everyone is, uh, is safe. Um, I think I also want to, to thank the Dubai Chamber for, even if it's bringing us virtually, but I think bringing uh, like-minded people to discuss uh, those topics is, is, is always good and, um, uh, and hopefully will make it as interesting as, as the topic is to everyone. So, I mean, definitely, and I think I, um, uh, there is absolutely no doubt that uh, the way people and organization uh, are behaving have changed dramatically. And, uh, and I would say it's, it's not only due to the unprecedented events that we witnessed in the past 12 months. I think that definitely this uh, COVID has accelerated a lot of this, but, but a lot was also coming in. And you mentioned it in your introduction and Dr. Yunus uh, mentioned it as well, is, is that the innovative use of data uh, that we're seeing today and every company whether it's a travel company or a sports company or um, or an organization that is enabling uh, their workers to work uh, remotely or a school uh, are trying to deliver these services uh, that are delivering the services are finding ways to to innovate uh, and i think more and more and, and we see it uh, very well in dubai and i think your Excellency, you are uh, much more passionate than any one of us to talk about this, but more and more, uh, uh, th those more traditional organizations that offer public services are also uh, being transformed digitally. Uh, what, we, what we see is definitely the developments in artificial intelligence, augmented reality, robotics, automation. Uh, all of this will continue to bring this innovation across 
the private and the public sector. And, and it's all about how do we enable governments to meet um, the, 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 the expectation of their citizens, I believe, because today the expectations are, are forever changing. And we, we look at this through two dimensions. I think there's transformation through technologies and there's transformation through capabilities. And the best way for us to really summarize this is what we call tech intensity. And tech intensity is, is it's, let's look at it like a, as a formula, if you want. Uh, it's how an organization or a public service uh, or anyone is adopting technology uh, multiplied by how much capability uh, they are building. And obviously all of this should be done because we're talking about data, uh, should be done in, in, a, in an environment uh, where uh, there is trust, uh, obviously. And, and what we've seen with, the, with this crisis is, is really tech intensity has been a key uh, for many organizations uh, to their business resilience and how they survived and how they went through, um, went through this crisis. So from a technology perspective, I think as, as a hyperscaler, um, we're, we're really proud to partner in driving digital transformation with many organizations. Um, uh, but also we recently launched, as you mentioned, I mean, we still say recently, it, it's going to be already two years uh, this coming June, uh, our cloud region in the United Arab Emirates uh, to really deliver uh, the complete intelligent and trusted Microsoft cloud to governments, organizations, and startup in the Middle East region. And very proudly, this, this, these were the, 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 first, uh, the first hyperscale cloud uh, in the Middle East for, uh, for Microsoft. And it's really about helping accelerate that digital transformation for organizations. Whether organizations want to meet compliance, whether organizations want faster time to market, uh, want a, a faster access to all of the capabilities that the cloud can bring to them. I think this was uh, really our contribution in terms of how do we bring technology to drive uh, this, uh, this transformation. And we continue to expand uh, definitely this what we call this region uh, in the UAE. The second uh, aspect of this tech intensity is capabilities. Uh, and we deeply believe that it's not enough uh, for us to deploy new technology. Uh, we need to help organization to build uh, from them. And um, those organizations that are building their own digital capabilities will thrive now, uh, but also uh, in the future. So we look at this as really the, the requirement for significant upskilling and reskilling uh, of individuals and applying a comprehensive uh, technology insight to support the government and the private sector in skilling up their workforce uh, with a number of initiatives and partnerships. I mean, we've been partnering with uh, organizations uh, definitely like Smart Dubai around how do we bring our artificial intelligence business school so that we help decision makers uh, uh, understand what are the implications of AI, how can they use artificial intelligence in their own businesses across so many industries, including uh, the government. Uh, we've put uh, available to, to a number of IT professionals what we call the cloud society, which is learning path um, for all type of IT professionals, developers, administrators, uh, around those new cloud technologies so that they are so that these are available to them free of charge so that they are able to cope as well with this uh, everlasting changes. Um, our partnership with uh, obviously at the federal level with the Ministry of uh, Artificial Intelligence, uh, the AI summer camps, the AI hackathons, um, the AI hackfest uh, that we do, but also very proudly with what we do with the UAE goes beyond at the borders uh, of the UAE, and 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 really thanks to the uh, to the to the generous leadership uh, that we have in the UAE, we've partnered as well uh, to um, to launch the one million Arab coder, um, which is really advancing the skills agenda not only uh, for this country but also for the Arab world, um, with an intensive curriculum to prepare coders to develop solutions on the cloud across the Arab world. So really a, a number of initiatives um, that we're working on, but all around this concept of uh, tech intensity. 
Very good, Leila. Thanks a lot. And, and, and really, um, I think the role of, of yourself and uh, as a hyperscaler, but as well, the involvement you had pervasive across the economy is seen. And, and the, 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 the big fact we've seen the last year is the business continuity, right? And you could see people that adopted cloud services and data innovation services in the cloud transform their businesses in the cloud. They uh, accelerated the comeback Faster. And we've seen this in other uh, cycles of economy. So the transformation at scale really pays when there is a new wave of growth. So great, great to see the, the contribution, but as well, the hunger to go beyond that. So, and you mentioned one thing, Leila, that is very relevant, which is a bit consumer behavior. And I'm going to pivot now to you, Bahia, uh, uh, on, uh, on what PepsiCo, because you are one of the top global consumer goods companies. You have multiple brands um, that define consumer behaviors of very different profile in a in a year where behaviors have changed dramatically of consumer because people stayed at home the shopping change so how did you leverage data how did you uh, how, how did you capture this bar- variety of changes to make sure that you continue to be relevant and you could continue to develop your your portfolios and thank you first for joining us uh, today Thank you, Zaria, and thank you, Dubai Chamber, for having me, and thank you to my fellow uh, panelists for such uh, rich discussion. So, as you mentioned, uh, data is actually the golden resource, and at PepsiCo, it actually impacts um, our business cycle across four different phases. So, at first, it's how we anticipate and predict uh, the, the different trends, and how this shifted recently more importantly during COVID is that we had to shift gears completely to real-time consumer sentiment tracking. We used online platforms, social listening tools across our top markets, and this enabled all of our marketing associates to have access on daily basis to consumer data. And we provided weekly updates to um, all of our um, leadership uh, teams. And as you said, we um, witnessed four key kind of insights that are emerging from COVID that helped shape our uh, plans differently. So consumers are staying at home and it was all about enriching this in-home experience. They're now looking to strengthen their uh, family relationships, staying at home, movie nights, cooking together, experimenting with different things. I'm sure all of us have been uh, through this different, um, differently across the lockdown uh, times. Uh, m- most of them have opted for staycations versus vacations. And hence, this brings me to the second point, which is that digital became their gateway to the world. It's the way they stayed connected with their friends and family. It's the way to be entertained. We witnessed a huge jumps, double digit growth across all of the streaming platforms, across the different social network uh, platforms as well. But amidst all that, consumers were dragging, dreading the economic impact. So there was um, amongst more than half of our population across the different countries are having financial worries uncertainty about job security and hence everyone was looking to rationalize spend so more than 40 percent of our consumers were trying to buy on promotions looking for uh, the best um, deals that they can get and accordingly they altered their shopping dynamics so at, as the wave goes across the different countries with the pandemic uh, they were stocking up at the beginning fi- only uh, focusing on essentials and hygiene products But then they started shifting channels. Online shopping, of course, boomed uh, across from our emerging markets and to the more developed one. Again, double digit growth on the high end across our different markets. And accordingly, what we needed to do uh, when we're deciding our plans is to become agile. So we changed the way we plan. Usually um, in our corporation, we do one year planning. But during this past 18 months, we became very agile and turning this into 90 days plan. So we would do monthly uh, um, situational analysis where we change our plans according to the ever-changing consumer and market dynamics. And accordingly, we opted to own the platforms that are more relevant to the consumer at this point in time. So for instance, in the KSA, consumers were entertainment deprived. We offer them promotions while buying our brands to enable them to have free Shehid, free and Remy subscriptions. In the UAE, where consumers were unable to go out and they wanted to enjoy the bringing the out of home in home, we gave them 
uh, free vouchers and free KFC meals and accordingly. And all of this was, again, um, in light of the affordability and economic pressure, giving them always in store, in the channels where they went, relevant promotions that would allow them to rationalize because this is what they were seeking. And amidst all that, we also wanted to give back to the community. So we had the Millions of Meal campaign that started in Pakistan and then rolled over to the, to the rest of our markets, which was, again, um, bringing relevance to our consumers. Um, and thirdly, when we executed, we adapted our plans to be at the new consumer touch point. So in the UAE, we partnered with uh, the key grocery shopping uh, online, as well as food ordering, such as Amazon, Zomato, Talabot, to be always available and relevant to our consumers as they shop there. But it wasn't only about promotions on our products, but also we enabled them to enrich their in-home experience uh, with a huge partnership with InstaShop, which was a big success in uh, the UAE, um, making them win board games, uh, playstations, and all of those gimmicks that would help enrich their uh, in-home experience. In Saudi as well, we brought them suhoor nights, so consumers weren't able to enjoy the rituals of Ramadan as they used to do before. We brought them entertainment mm -hmm. digitally, and it's all about uh, kind of providing bite-sized engaging um, um, experiences to our consumers to help them navigate through uh, those tough times. And finally, the last step of our business cycle is always to assess and evaluate before we kind of shift gears again. And we were faced with the now the need to adopt new technologies that will allow us to what used to take from an insights evaluation two months would now need to be turned around in a couple of days, maximum one week. And we were uh, fortunate enough to have solid global partnerships. Uh, with uh, uh, our online platforms and online agencies. And we managed to bring those uh, global partnerships into our region and to utilize them such as uh, Black Swan, Street Bees, uh, Discuss IO. And this upgraded our evaluation and tracking tools to ensure a faster turnaround uh, to our business decision making. Thanks a lot, Bahia. Very, very insightful. And uh, I, I, think, I think this is a fantastic wrap of the initial first part, which talks about how data has become a pervasive member in our day-to-day -day life, business, and so on. Now, moving into the next uh, step in the journey is for it to make the best of it, there needs to be a transformation first on the technology capabilities, but as well on the skills, right? And uh, Excellency mentioned a few things about how Dubai invested ahead of the curve on the youth to enable those. Uh, by, by you, you mentioned about how you're thinking the, the behaviors on that, but is this, so the, the question is, how do we bring this across all companies? How do we bring this across all organizations, right? And I would like now to start with a thought inspirative video from Microsoft uh, to, to, to explain about why and why data-driven innovation will make the North Star for all of us tomorrow. So can we explain it and uh, share the video, please? Today, right now, you have more power at your fingertips than entire generations that came before you. Think about that. That's what technology really is. It's possibility, it's adaptability, it's capability. But in the end, it's only a tool. What's a hammer without a person who swings it? It's not about what technology can do, it's about what you can do with it. You're the voice, and it's the microphone. When you're the artist, it's the paintbrush. We are living in the future we always dreamed of. We have mixed reality that changes how we see the world, and AI empowering us to change the world we see. You have more power at your fingertips than entire generations that came before you. So here's the question, what will you do with it? So data and innovation, that's the, the, the name of the game. And I want to now to be back into you, Leila, about how Microsoft, so what you've lived in the last 12 months is a massive change. You just need to see how even the features of Teams have evolved over, and the adoption of Teams at scale has evolved over the last few months, right? So I'd like to, if you can elaborate about 
how do you uh, develop and customize all these solutions that can really help businesses and, uh, and governments to support the transformation process? Because it's so relevant, uh, the, the enabling part that, that you bring. Yeah. Um, thank you, Javier. And I, I think, um, well, obviously, in the past, uh, in the past 12 months, uh, Microsoft has been really at the forefront of the largest at scale uh, remote work, remote uh, everything experiment the, the, the world has seen. And, 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 uh, and I think we've worked with organization of all shapes and sizes across the world to address this. Um, I mean, on top of this amazing uh, experiment, I think because of our already our presence from a productivity perspective, um, and with so many users uh, across the world, we, we have an understanding of the digital and hybrid trends um, uh, that, that, that are now happening. I mean, I think uh, what we're seeing more and more as well is uh, a lot of this hybrid uh, talk uh, that is happening. Is it going to be a hybrid workspace, um, a hybrid uh, way of, of uh, providing uh, services. Uh, we still see shops and people go to shops, but we, we, we see also that there are different consumer behavior. And I think Bahia has, touched, has really touched very well, uh, very well on this. This understanding has not only seen the rollout of applications such as Microsoft Teams at an at a, at a, uh, unbelievable scale, uh, but I, I think what we recently saw is that this concept will need to be further uh, and, and we'll need to advance further, I would say. And um, we just uh, um, uh, announced the, uh, the launch of the first ever employee experience platform, uh, which we call Microsoft Viva. It's still very new. Uh, we've announced this, I think, um, maybe a week or 10 days ago already uh, through, uh, um, through uh, also a virtual, a virtual event um, keynoted by our CEO, Satya Nadella. And, and it's really the, the first employee experience platform that is bringing the tools for employee engagement, employee collaboration, uh, but also more and more, uh, and we've been talking about this a lot, uh, employee learning uh, and this really rising topic, which is around the well-being of employees as well, all embedded into one uh, platform, uh, but also how do we help um, uh, knowledge workers to really harness the data that they have and, and, and discover, uh, discover this knowledge. And all of this happening directly into the flow of how people are working. So, so I believe our, exper our extensive experience uh, and that remote work experiments has really helped us to, to go deeper into how do we uh, develop those solutions uh, that are relevant uh, to, to, to businesses and that are relevant to workers through Microsoft, through something like Microsoft uh, Viva. Uh, but I think more importantly, it's important to remember that digital transformation is not only about customizing technology solutions, right? Uh, I think in the video we say artificial intelligence, is, it is just a tool. Uh, it is just a tool that we put in, in the hands of, of uh, organizations and, and, and users all the time. It's, it, but it's also about how do you facilitate uh, the understanding and the adoption of these technologies. And um, a lot of research is happening around this, uh, but it's, it's also showing that there are key factors that need to be in place uh, so that you can report out that you've successfully transformed in a digital uh, in a digital world and this pass requires a number of factors uh, as I mentioned um, one of them that I mentioned previously is really how do you build this culture of of tech intensity who are the people that you put on the team how do you enable your people to actually uh, embrace this new way of delivering services uh, to their to their own uh, to their own clients um, moving from a brick and mortar to uh, more of a digital. So, so it's really this, again, this all goes back to this tech, uh, to this tech intensity. So whether yeah. it's us bringing our team of engineers, data scientists and experts to contribute, uh, uh, to contribute uh, and help our customers in their digital transformation journey and their migration to the cloud, or enabling uh, through the many enterprise skilling initiatives uh, that we embed into uh, into this. 
What we know in the UAE is the UAE government is working on bridging that skills gap. Uh, the UAE move towards a future economy will be driven by people, expertise, and uh, and skills. And this is and this is how we are trying to balance between the technology and the capabilities uh, that we bring forward. Yes, and 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 linking now these because you have a role not only in the big organizations, but you yes. have a big role into enabling the smaller ones, right? So I always say, uh, I'm an entrepreneur as well on my side, and, and I, I always say to my, my, my team in the companies I've invested or in, developed this, there's never been a better time to build a startup because the cost, before you needed to have a, cent, a, 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 a data, so a server, you needed to have HR, you need to have finance, you need to have a team before you had the first dollar in the pocket. Today, you can get everything as a service right you get you you pay for what you consume and the platform players and uh, and and microsoft as a key enabler of across has a big role into that so startups have all the ai is almost uh, publicly made available so th there's no not on, so there's a lot of enablement that come from you so then leila how how do you partner uh, with public entities with other partners, uh, large corporates and so on. And we are partners globally as well uh, together. Yeah. So how do you bring this together to enable the startups? Because the startups is the ones that really enable the innovation at scale and the transformation at scale, right? So how do you do that? I think, so So we we do have a Microsoft for Startup program and um, and, and very proudly we, we are partners in the, in, in the UAE with a number of, um, important organization. I mean, in Dubai with Area 2071, in Abu Dhabi with Hub 71, uh, we have partnerships with uh, with big organizations, obviously like Accenture, uh, but also with Emirates Airlines and their incubators. So, so startups are really at the core of uh, a, a lot of what we do in a in a country to uh, to really drive national impact, uh, but also empowering that economy to, to flourish and grow. And, uh, uh, and, and the program is really built uh, across three pillars. Uh, one is we want to give access to technology to these startups. Uh, you mentioned the Azure platform that we have in the UAE. So it's really, how do we give them access to, those, uh, to these capabilities? Um, uh, we've acquired GitHub a couple of years ago, which is the biggest um, uh, repository of, of code in the world. Uh, so really it's, it's enabling uh, those, uh, those startups to, to have this access. The second, I think, and it's probably the most important one is specifically during the crisis that happened is how do we give them access to markets, right? And how do we help uh, those startups to publish their products on something as powerful as the Microsoft marketplace, which has reach across the globe. Uh, and, and, and then be, they become kind of an extension of this platform that we have across the globe. Uh, but we as a team uh, that is deployed in more than 130 countries, we also become an extension to this startup that was born um, in Emirates Towers and is today able to go and, um, and, and, and provide its services and sell its services. Uh, to anyone in the world, uh, whether it's in Latin America, in the US, or, uh, or even in Australia. And, and the third aspect is obviously that community. Uh, and I think in the UAE, we're very lucky because there is a vibrant community of mentors, of VCs, of accelerators and incubators. So I think uh, through our partnerships with the likes of Area 2071 and Hub 71 and others, um, we're able to bring together the, the, the entire community across this partner network uh, that help those, uh, those uh, startup uh, strive. Um, uh, I mean, as much as we were first responders at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, helping schools get online, helping organization uh, enable their workers to, to, uh, to, work, uh, to work remotely, I think with startups today, is, it's really how do we help them recover uh, from this crisis, but also reimagine uh, their future through those different access to, to markets and, and broader communities. Thank you, Leila. Yeah, very, very relevant. And, and now, seeing about, uh, let me discuss a bit how the business transformation has helped you, Bahia and, and PepsiCo, 
to, to, to perform differently, like, and especially in the last year that everything, as you mentioned earlier, has changed. So what advice would you tell? There's so many companies that are not getting it right yet. So what advice would you give to them, right, about bringing data and analytics at the core? Um, I love the term that Leila just uh, used about reimagining the future. So honestly, to be able to do that, you need to do two things. First, invest and then experiment as well, because we're all new to this and it's ever changing as we go in. So um, in terms of investment, you need to invest both in the tools themselves and in the di digital platforms and uh, strike the right partnerships with, with the agencies that are able to provide that. But experimentation comes with doing new ways of things. So for example, what, what we did um, during the past year is that we realized that it's, it's very crucial to be cl even closer to the consumer's pulse and to have that on a one-to-one -one basis. So we established an online uh, platform where an associate who is sitting in the UAE and wants to talk to a consumer in the KSA or in India or in Pakistan can do that just the next day on a one-to-one -one basis, real time. And not only stopping at that, but we created a reiterative model where actually we established online creative panels of consumers and influencers where we bounce off ideas. So we always kind of pride ourselves at PepsiCo that we start and end with the consumer, but it evolved this time that it, we start with the consumers, we validate ideas, and we even create new ideas with the consumers. So again, coming back to reimagining the future, it's about piloting and experimenting. And this is where actually we got the most value and we, we found um, added value and venturing into different territories. And, and to be able to reimagine, Bahia, so you need different types of skills in terms of the data science capabilities, right? So uh, how did you reimagine the type of profiles you needed or how did you retrain, upskill the team you had already to be able to perform uh, the way you're doing with these new requirements on the, on the, on the customers? So, so thankfully, this has been always part of our vision at PepsiCo. So for the past couple of years, there's uh, different hubs across the world that were created, actually made of data scientists. So for instance, in our part of the world, our hub uh, sits in Hyderabad. And this is a hub solely dedicated to data scientists who have um, their, their core competency is about manipulating immense amount of data. You know that we're in the era of big data and, and instead of kind of easily getting lost in the vast amount of data that you get, they sit, they have an integral role within our bigger insights organization. So they have a role of manipulating, filtering, collating all of those uh, different types of data and providing online dashboards that enable the rest of the insights community to to um, decipher those different trends, looking at historical trends, but as well to be able to predict and to um, foresee any upcoming trends. So uh, thankfully, as I said, we've been preparing for this for the past couple of, couple of years, and it actually came live at the beginning of 2020. So it was a journey, and we had to, ac so we had to accelerate it because of the pandemic, but it really worked in our favor. And uh, th thanks a lot, Bahia. And, and I would like now to, to leverage what uh, Excellency uh, you mentioned at the beginning, right? You said that if I need to summarize something you mentioned very strongly, is that how did you bet on the youth to build new capabilities, new mindset, new hunger, and new skills into uh, the smart Dubai, right? So how could companies leverage from your learnings on the journey to to bring analytics, uh, artificial intelligence at the core of the services that now you're so pervasively del delivering across the, the Emirate? Sure, I, I believe this is an important question to, to be addressed right and, and to share the right experiences uh, around it. And I think you know the simple answer to this complex question is that going back to basics. Mm. Uh, and, and that you know, comes into two different buckets that we need to look at. Uh, one which is really important, and this is touching everything that we're doing over here, is to understand the challenge that we're going to solve. And I think, you know, the business problem side is really important to get it right at the beginning. And I think going back to basics, I think what we've learned through this pandemic is what really matters is today. And what we have in our hand of problems that we want to solve. Yes, we need to use an advanced technologies. Yes, we need to use 
advanced capabilities, but they know in today's terms, you know, this is, there is a problem that we have in our hand today that needs to be solved. Second, you know, okay, now then I have it, I have identified it now, how, what I'm gonna do about it. And how do I work, you know, if I work in the same way that I used to work, you know, uh, in the previous uh, way, you know, I might not reach to the result that is really addressing my need in the future. And I think this is where uh, the investment and the youth, this is an investment into creating the capabilities that have the mindset that can drive this within an organization with two things. One is providing them with the digital platform and the backbone. And as my colleagues and you yourself have highlighted over here is that you're providing the digital capabilities as a platform, as a service. You know, these are services offered. They don't need really to go into nitty gritty of how do you build a platform. These are services offered. These are problems that's been identified and being solved. Second is, you know, to, bring, to give them the right environment and equip them with the right talents. So today, yes, when we talk about data analytics, when we talk about data-driven solutions, it sounds very advanced, it sounds very complex. But when it comes down to, you know, it's simple things. We do need, yes, the uh, data scientists who are really advanced in terms of using the right, uh, I would say, sciences into solving different problems, but supporting them with the right level of ecosystem. They do need to have the data engineers. They are a great asset into making sure that there is the integration level that is needed within the city. There is second is also with the right business analyst who can make sense of what was really developed and uh, have been achieved in a consumer basis, you know, into individuals who are going to benefit from those services. And, and fourth is also to add the right level of you know, management around it. I think in today's term, we call them the product owners, we call them the product managers. They are working in this agile manner. And all of them are sitting not in a hierarchical organization. They are sitting in a very flat structure that's helping them to collaborate, mm -hmm. collaborate internally and collaborate with the partners out. And I think this is the great, great railing. You know, agility is really important. Operating in, in a flat manner, assembling and deassembling a team with the different talents is really important. And having the digital capabilities at the heart with understanding the problem that we are solving over here. And I think if you use this equation together and always you know, look into the, uh, the future challenges that we have and bring them today, I think great solutions comes up. And I think this is what we've seen also during this pandemic. I think a lot of global challenges has been thrown at countries, at cities. But if you answer, you know, if you look at it simply, how we've been able you know, to, to evolve from there, because you know, everyone went to the basic and this collaboration have really came very strong together, working in an agile manner. Everyone seemed as a one big team, rather than looking at it from different you know, uh, organizations or different departments or different, every uh, company that everyone became one. And I think this was the, the, the strong part of it. Building a talent requires just looking into some specific skill set, but bringing the flavor of those together putting them together with the right problem in hand and also you know, uh, uh, enabling them with the right digital capabilities that today we see the right equation into solving a lot of problems. I highlighted at the beginning of this uh, session is that we built an, uh, with an investment uh, invest in Dubai platform within four months. It was built exactly based on this formula. A problem that was identified, uh, uh, Investors are having challenges into uh, opening a new businesses. Uh, a team was formulated from 25 government entities as being one big government team that's working and collaborating together. The right technology was brought in and also with the right talents. And this is the result you saw it today already. And I think, you know, this is my advice to the companies. Go back to the basics and use these talents into bringing the future to today. Good, great advice, uh, Excellency. So I think now we've, we've covered two key stages. One, understanding how data has a massive role today and will only increase. Two, how we bring the data-driven reinvention, right, uh, at the core to change the skills and to change the businesses. And now I wanted to, to move into the la our last part, which talks about the role of regulation, the, law, the limitations we need to put because there's privacy limitations, there's security, there's, uh, uh, so we need to protect as well, right? So the ethical use of data, the, the, there's a lot of dimensions that need to be catered well, right? And so focusing on this and starting with this, and I'm gonna start with you here about um, what, what, the, what limitations uh, are you considering when, when 
you need to deal with a massive amount of consumer data you manage, right? Because you you, you have a fantastic, phenomenal pool of consumers, but um, how do you take into account privacy uh, or how do you make it relevant as well, the data? Because to, to make sure that, that the, the personalization on the actions uh, makes sense w- without affecting the, the boundaries of privacy. So uh, I, I would love to hear about that. So we've established the fact that data is power, yet the level of power actually differs between first party data, second and third party. So I think the limitation always lies in uh, the level of data collection, as you mentioned, the rights and issues around security and privacy, but also around data handling. But at the end of the day, all of this is crucial for quick and actionable insights, as well as fast decision making. And to His Excellency's earlier point, I think the key challenge here uh, remains around the human factor. So data on its own will never be enough. So no matter how sophisticated the tools we use, how many data we we collate, it's all about the human factor that would turn this into actionable hypotheses. So one of our key challenges is to always up our game when it comes to developing human capabilities in addition to always seeking the newest technologies when it comes to new tools that enable us to be closer to the consumers in in real time. Another challenge also lies upon our partners, our agencies, because they also need to always up their game when it comes to being uh, competitive and having a competitive edge in the digital world without jeopardizing all of the security and and privacy um, uh, issues that you were mentioning. And it's all about building this trusting relationship with the consumers and being able to provide them with relevant content that will allow them to always come back to you and give you feed you back with this uh, data. Very good. And and Excellency, back back to you then on the on the role of regulation on that, right? So because um, we we've seen that uh, globalization brought a, a lot of benefits, but we're seeing on the data side. Uh, uh, the role that maybe is a counteracting effort into this, creating a bit more the, 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 the national data residency, but as well data flows, which have a very strong purpose and a good reason for that. But w- what are the challenges that regulation uh, about the data and the data flows brings to from your perspective? Well, I think you, know, you are touching on an important uh, element of, uh, of, of how to handle data. And I think... Uh, Regulation is one key aspect that uh, kind of streamlines this exchange of the data you know, cross borders, cross organizations, cross countries and cross cities that I think everyone is, is keen to. Uh, it enables also the uh, digital economy, which I think you know, everyone is, 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 uh, is, is keen towards getting into that point. And I think to have a balanced regulation is one of the key solutions towards uh, how much we need to look at this uh, challenge from privacy and security point of view versus you know, how much do we want to regulate it, keeping in mind that today's technology is very different than tomorrow's. So how do we make sure that when we are designing a regulation that caters for today's challenges and future needs? And I think, you know, I think we don't want to go in an area to discuss the over-regulation because this is puts a lot of restrictions, limitations in terms of uh, allowing this data flow and this data exchange. But also we don't want to have it you know, so unregulated because again, you know, there are a consumer, there is an individual, there is an asset that we need to protect at the end of the day. The way that we've looked at these, all of those challenges that are around ourselves over here with different approaches that are there globally, we've seen a very much restricted approach towards having a strict regulations and high compliance towards it versus you know, totally unregulated or deregulated uh, environments to come, to come balanced. And I think a couple of examples here from uh, UAE and Dubai specifically into the data area, then we've looked at data not only from the context of data privacy, because this creates a challenge in itself. Look at the data as a holistic approach and look at different elements of it, because you do have a couple of objectives, the economic part of it, the exchange, efficiency in the services, and also protecting this data and keeping it safe. So with that, you know, Dubai have launched the Dubai Data Law, and it has first of its kind to govern the data within the Emirates of Dubai. Second, we backed it up with enough and detailed agile policies. Those policies is kind of addressing today's need and looking at the future. 
And keeping it as a policy, this means this, there is a flexibility into adding and removing, you know, the kind of policies that needs to get into it. A third, I think, you know, was important, you know, also to look at the future challenges when it comes to ethical manners of data and also solutions such as artificial intelligence. Dubai have launched again an eth AI ethical principles and uh, guidelines wherein we are looking into these fundamental challenges of data privacy, looking at uh, equality, looking at transparency uh, and, 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 and fairness in a way that are very agile. Again, as I said, you know, it's a soft regulation that we are using and putting it enough regulation around ourselves. I think one of the things that we want to see more, I think, is you know, to come more, to have more uh, globalized approach towards it, standardizing the way that we want to exchange these data, the way that we want to uh, uh, protect those data and have a unified definition around what does a privacy mean you know, globally. And that, inspire, that you know, enables the transformation that we are talking. I think, the, again, you know, the, the point I'm trying to make over here is a balanced approach, uh, minimum regulation, you know, and being very agile is a key success into, into those areas. A lot of initiatives is going down here and in the country in UAE. We have a lot of discussion with the private sectors and having this continuous dialogue. You know, they are the ones who are developing these advanced technologies, bringing them closely to us, you know, understanding the challenges also from their point of view. I think what's enabling us to have a better, I would say, or advanced regulation in this challenging uh, zone. It's, it's very uh, enlightening to see the innovation in regulation because typically regulation sits behind and, and, and is, a, is a lie. But here we're seeing ahead of the pack uh, and, and, and uh, setting a bit this, this uh, um, enabling factor uh, uh, for, for the future uh, solution. So that's, I think that, that is critical. And, and now, Leila, to, to, to wrap up on, on this section, I think it would be great to understand how, how do you support your customers uh, on, in terms of data protection, security, privacy, and compliance, of course, because all these regulations need to be mapped on how you provide services, right? And you have, a, with the journey to cloud, and yes, there is still, uh, globally, we're saying that there's still 80% of the workloads that are still in the data centers. They need to be moved to the cloud, but this is coming. In the next couple, three years, we're going to have most on the cloud then you have a primary role to make sure that what Excellency Junior was mentioning is delivered, right? And is secured within a certain territory, with a certain regulation for the country, but for the individuals, to protect the individuals, because ultimately that's what we want as well, right? So what, what is your uh, approach into this, Leila? I, I think there's, there's, no, uh, there's no debate around uh, the, the fact that data flow and data usage has, has has, uh, and security, privacy considerations have become really one of the, probably one of the hottest topic uh, that is today on the table of so many decision makers and regulators. And, 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 and I mean, when I hear uh, what Dr. Yunus is saying, I think, again, the UAE is, 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 is really thinking ahead uh, in terms of those. The, the, what's happening as well is that Organizations have a need to adopt new technologies. Data is flowing all over, uh, but uh, unfortunately, the uh, regulations uh, and the compliance need need more time to to uh, to catch up. And what we see is a lot of organizations are unsure about how they need to apply um, those regulations. How do they ensure that they are compliant? Uh, so that when, especially when things are moving uh, are moving that fast. So, and as a hyperscaler, uh, I think uh, with the fact that we are providing such a big infrastructure of data centers across the world, 160 plus data centers uh, across the world, then we have a, a big responsibility uh, to make sure that uh, when a customer comes and has trust into our uh, cloud services, uh, they also have the trust that we, are make sure that we will make sure that those services are secure, um, the data is private, uh, but also that the use of uh, those services is compliant with the biggest number of uh, regulations that are out there. And, and I can, I mean, I can show you a, a slide that would be a kind of an eye test in terms of the number of regulations that are out there that we have to comply uh, with, whether it's in healthcare or in financial services or GDPR, 
or other privacy law or the uh, California Act of Privacy. So, so as much as possible, we we um, as as new regulations come, we make sure that our technology complies with this new regulation. We make quick changes to the way data is uh, is handled across our data centers, and we provide the tools as well to the end user to make sure that they are compliant. So, um, and we have a, 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 this compliance, a, a compliance manager, which really help end users to look across different regulations and see, am I compliant, am I not compliant? Because a lot of the compliance as well is not only on the hyperscaler, but it's also on the users. And some others are a joint responsibility. Um, in the UAE, we've done, Tremendous work with the with with the uh, um, IA standards uh, that are issued by NISA and, and have those IA standards actually as part of our compliance uh, manager. We're doing tremendous work with the likes of uh, the Dubai Electronic and Security uh, Commission desk to also make sure that all of those compliance, uh, uh, all those regulations are embedded into, uh, into our local data centers that are part of our actually uh, global, uh, global fabric. Uh, so these are some of the examples uh, that Very I can good. talk to about. Excellent, Leila. And, and I wanted to open, we have some great questions coming from the broader audience and, and I want to thank everyone to, to bring them forward. I'm not gonna, shoot, we have five minutes, so I'm, I'm gonna just, uh, select a few and ask, uh, please, to be very, very sharp on the on the answers, right? So, first one for uh, Excellency. Um, so, uh, what what are the challenges of, uh, of establishing a smart city? I think Dubai has become one of the benchmarks around a smart city, and you uh, sit on the on the reins of one of these enabling factors. So, what have been the challenges you went through? And if you can just make it very, very crisp, the answers, so that we can we can go to some others, please. Thank you. I think uh, one of the challenging areas that uh, we've had to address from the very beginning is that, you know, for a city to become a smart city, what does that really mean? Okay. You know, and where do you start from there? You know, I think there is a fundamental definition issue we have over here. What means uh, smart for Dubai is very different than what it might mean for uh, Bombay as a city. You know, the city needs are very different, yet, you know, as a human, we are still have some basic needs to come over here. And I think Dubai have always been ambition in that area. So we've made the definition that we think that can be catering, you know, uh, the way that cities can smart, smart transform and still, you know, have it, you know, uh, customized towards the need of that city. So we've been one of the major enablers into uh, putting the standards and the guidelines of what does the smart city needs. And I think, you know, for every challenge that we've seen, we've always looked at it as a, from a lens of opportunity, as always our wise leadership have taught us on how to look at them. You know, to us, any challenge have always been an opportunity. This was one of the great challenge of mm -hmm. smart city was, is what was the definition of it. Another thing, you know, I would, uh, I would, I would add to it is over here is, you know, uh, how to uh, bring different parties to collaborate together. I think collaboration is one of the big themes of smart cities bringing the different constituents from public and private sector together with the individuals to agree on what is the smart transformation plan can be. I think this is one of the key challenges that we've been, uh, I would think, sharpening it all the way, you know, and understanding it better and collaborate more with the uh, different uh, partners uh, that, that we needed to think, uh, to, to work with. But again, this is, you know, my second, uh, and I would leave the room for a month, please, if you would like to add. Thank you, Excellency. And, and just to wrap up, one final, but I think this discussion is having an impact in our audience because I want to put this question to you, Bahia, on um, what kind of education is needed for a successful career in data. So people have seen that we need to go for data. So I think you guys are having an impact into the message. So Bahia, what uh, counseling you can give to our, our uh, audience on, on, the, on the career to, to get to become a, a data scientist? Yeah, so there's a wide span of specialties, but kind of to start with, um, it varies from statistics to modeling to computing to computer science. So basically, it's anything that has to do with data manipulation and um, usage of the new tools and being able to kind of go over immense amounts of data and manipulate it in a way that gives, gives meaningful insights at the end. So Very good. No, appreciate that. And, and I think we wrap up here, but just one comment, as we said at the beginning, that is 
over 700,000 a gap in terms of people able to, to, to be data scientists needed uh, every year. So there is a huge career and it's not all about the education, but uh, well, the experimentation, the learning process, right? So we need to think that this is like uh, in, in a teaching hospital, right? Where you, you become a trainee and you learn by doing and then over a sudden you mature and so on. And, and I think the, the, the apprenticeship models that are put at scale within organizations are fundamental public and government. So I would like to wrap up thanking uh, um, the amazing contribution of uh, the government side, the uh, enablement side, hyperscaler, the consumer goods. So we had the fantastic panel, uh, uh, Excellency, uh, Bahia, Leila. It's been really a pleasure to have you. With a, we've learned a lot from your thoughts or your journeys and looking forward to more discussions. And I'm going to hand over to you, Leila, to, for a closing remarks. Thank you very much, Xavier. Uh, what a fantastic morning. Thank you to all of our panelists this morning for taking the time to share with us their expertise uh, and guidance and advice. I think I'll go back to school again and retrain myself based on what Bahia said and the fantastic job opportunities that we have available in this industry. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us this morning. We hope you enjoyed the session um, and the dialogue as much as we did here at Dubai Chamber of Commerce. We would love to hear your feedback. Uh, there is an icon in the top right hand side of your screen. Uh, please spend a few moments before you log off just to give us your feedback and comments on the session and what more, what more Dubai Chamber of Commerce can do to improve your experience of our events. Um, also, if you took notes, if delegates took notes during the webinar, uh, please don't forget to download them before you exit the platform. To our panelists, again, Dubai Chamber of Commerce would like to take this opportunity to thank you all for giving up your precious time and contributing, as I said, your wise wisdom and expertise in this field. Um, and we hope for our delegates, uh, you'll be able to join us in our forthcoming webinar, um, which is actually taking place on the 7th of April um, with the title, The Future of Energy. And as His Excellency mentioned, His Excellency mentioned in the beginning, um, the energy, uh, the environment and everything, it, it, it basically is a journey. So we know everything about data. Thanks to everybody today. And now what can we do to improve the environment uh, that we're all part of? Um, so thank you very much again. Uh, we hope to see you all again soon. And please enjoy the rest of your day and stay safe. Thank you. Take care.